Hey, good morning, Faith Church. Let's stand to our feet. Come on. How many are ready to praise him this morning? I praise him in the I praise when I'm sure And I praise when I'm doubting I praise when I'm numb I praise when surrounding Cause praise is Cause praise is a word my enemies drowning hey. As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to Continue to press into okay, the Lord Mariana, this morning. Mariana. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he rescued me with his love.
Come on, church, let's continue to rejoice. We're so grateful today, Lord Jesus.
all that's in my heart this morning, Lord. And I know, and I know it's not much. Except for a heart of singing heart. We sing to you. Come on, let's throw up our hands. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. someone to pray with you this morning you want someone to join with you and love on you we would love to join with you in prayer we would like to let you know that you're not alone you're not by yourself come on let's just press in I feel the presence of the Lord in this house come on his presence is here this morning thank you Jesus Before the 
of that praise. He's worthy of us saying thank you. He's worthy of us giving it all back to him because he's the one that gave it to us in the first place. Like Pastor Solomon sang about, it's the breath in our lungs that we praise him with. He is the one that gave us breath in the very beginning in Genesis. But sometimes when life hits us, and our breath is difficult to breathe in, we don't always praise him because it's not comfortable anymore. We love to praise the Lord when we're on the mountaintop, when it's easy, when things are going great, it's easy to praise him, but when things are difficult, it's not as easy to praise him, but he's worthy of the praise just as much on the bad days as he is on the good days. You know, like, we all are kind of going through um, the sinuses right now together, allergies, and suddenly you take for granted all of the days that you were able to breathe before. But he deserved the praise when we could breathe just as much as he deserves the days when we're struggling to get breath inside of our own lungs. If it's so much evident in the physical, imagine how much more evident it is in the spiritual that he is worthy of our praise when it's tough for us to give it back to him. He deserves it all. So Lord, forgive us for giving you praise only when it's convenient to us. Forgive us for giving you praise only when we are comfortable, when everything is lined up just the way that we thought it should be. And Lord, we give you everything. You are worthy of it all on the mountaintops. And when we're crawling through the valleys, you deserve our praise. You deserve our worship. You deserve our adoration because you're the one that gave us this blessing of life. Father, we thank you for what you are doing in us, what you are doing through us, and we'll praise you knowing that there's victory on the other side, that you've already seen us be victorious through the battles that we are facing. So we'll praise you even then. Give us a desire to praise you fully every single day, on the good and on the hard on the easy and on the not so easy. We give you praise because you're the one that gave us breath. And in your name we pray, amen. Aren't you glad you came today? Before you sit down, wave at the cameras. We got a lot of people watching on live stream. Go say hey to somebody, tell them they look good this morning as you're making your way back to your seat. If it's your very first time here at Faith Church Lubbock and the seat back in front of you is a yellow visitor card, be sure to fill that out. We have a gift just for you guys after service, church family. Don't forget to fill out your connection card. You can do that online too. Let us know how we can be praying with you, partnering with you, doing life with you, because that's what we do here at Faith Church Lubbock. Pastor Stormy has an incredible message today. He said on Wednesday night, it'll knock your socks off. I heard it first service and it did. So make sure your shoes are tied tight while these video announcements play. Get your Bibles ready and be ready to hear from the Lord. Hey Faith Church, we are so glad you're joining us today. If this is your first time with us, fill out a visitor form and drop it off at the info center in the foyer. We would love to get to know you. Baby Dedication Sunday is April 14th. Register your little one at the info center or online by Wednesday, April 10th, so you and your family can participate in this special day. Cherished ladies, mark your calendars for April 12th at 6.30 p.m. for a pizza and PJ party. We'll spend the evening building friendships, making friendship bracelets, and having fun. So invite your besties, wear your comfiest clothes, and let us know you're coming by registering online at faithchurchlubbock.com. If you are in need of any food, clothing, or household items, the Faith Closet and Food Pantry will be open immediately following service. Please be sure to pick up your kids first and then head upstairs to let our team assist you. Our FC group night is held every first Sunday of the month, and we want to see you there. This is the night for building community, and we have tons of groups to choose from this semester. And dinner will be provided after. Check out our website to see the lineup, meet the leaders, and find your group. Men of Iron is coming quickly, and we're looking for corporate sponsors to advertise their business and be a blessing to all of the men attending. If you are a business owner or know someone who might be interested, please visit menofironconf.com sponsor and fill out an application form. I prophesy that from now on, I will not live under the curse, but I will live under the generational blessing, Father. Right now, I prophesy over every man that's here that from this day on, things will be different, Father. If we will come back to trust the Word, to live in this Word, 
to know what he's doing in our lives and trust him, God has an amazing future for us. Do I obey God? Well, it's going to cost me something. Do I obey God even when I don't fully understand him? Oh, when God found me, I was depressed. When God found me, I was confused. When God found me, oh, oh, I had a past. But God began to put a new foundation in my life. God began to knock down some walls of hostility. God began to put the light of his word where there had only been darkness. on all things Faith Church, follow us on social media or visit us at faithchurchlubbock.com. All right, good morning, good morning. Good to see you. I welcome all of you. If you're here for the baptism, we're glad you came. We we were able to baptize just short of 30, just a little bit. So what a blessing. Yeah, great day, great day. Uh, if you're watching my live stream, we're glad to have you here today. And before I start, I just want to tell you something. The Lord wants you to know that God loves you. Jesus loves you, okay? No matter your flaws and your mistakes, God loves you today. And I think some of you need to hear that. And sometimes I encourage you to look in the mirror and just tell yourself, God loves me. It's the truth, okay? they will set you free when you do that. If you need a Bible, once you get your hand up real high, our ushers will get you the Word of God. Then once you get a Bible, get your hand up real high, and I highly recommend you getting the Word here with me today. Go with me to Psalm 31. The 31st Psalm is where we'll begin, and we are beginning here a new series on detours. And I'll begin to explain a little bit about where this is going to go, and you're going to, like I said, Psalm 31, so... Life is interesting. It's like we go from one scene to another, one chapter to another, kind of cycles of life. And with every cycle of life that I go into, there's always more responsibility. And so with more responsibility, there takes more discipline. And with more discipline, there takes more character. And so you think about the, the cycles we go through in life. You go from being a a little guy, and then you get into elementary school, then you go to middle school, then you go to high school, and then many go on to college. Those are all cycles, and with each cycle, there's more responsibility. And then we use this word dying. And sometimes we have the thought, I'm just dying to get my first job. I'm just dying to buy my first car. I'm just dying to get married. I'm just dying to have kids. I'm just dying to get rid of the kids. (laughs) I'm just dying to retire, and then ultimately we're just dying to die. And so you begin to see all those cycles. Well, when I highlight every one of these cycles, in these cycles we're going to go through some detours. And a detour of life, it's not a bad thing. The thing about a detour is you don't get there when you think you're going to get there, and sometimes you don't get there how you think you're going to get there. And so when we talk about detours, just think about a road detour. When I see a sign that says detour ahead, you know what that sign says? It says something needs to be repaired, something needs to be fixed, or something needs to be developed. And so when we go through these things called spiritual detours, there's something in your life that God wants to construct, something to repair, something to to develop or something to fix. And I highlight this again. You're going to go through detours in your life periodically. And so this is what we're going to talk about here for several weeks. Look here with me at Psalms 31, verse 14. But as for me, now this is King David, but you might as well put your name in there. But, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I I rely on you, O Lord. I have confidence in you, O Lord. Now, here's the question about that. Do you really? 
Do, do I really trust in the Lord? And he goes on to say, I say, you are my God. You alone are my God. Now, when King David made these comments here, he was in very, very difficult circumstances. And even in difficult circumstances, I got to get to a place and say, Father God, I put, I put my trust in you. I, I don't always understand what's going on, but I still put my trust in you. Verse 15, my times are in your hand. It's an incredible statement. My times are in your hand. But sometimes we may have the thought, my, my time's in God's hand, but God, you need to hurry up. My times are in your hand, Father God, but on delay. Come on, move it, move it, move it. But if I really believe my times are in God's hands, that means I get to a place in my life where my life doesn't beat to my clock or my way, but it beats to his. And again, God's never late. God's never early, but he's always right on time. My hands or my times are in your hands, Father God. Deliver them from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake, O God. Now look at verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who feared you. To those who feared you. Do you know one of the best definitions I can give you for the fear of the Lord is to take God serious. And it's interesting, he says here, how great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you. Now here's a question for you. Do you take God seriously? He goes on to say, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. So he's, he's got great things prepared for us. He just said that. But it was conditional on those ones who fear him and trust him, even in difficult circumstances. Now, turn with me to the Old Testament, way back there in the front, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6, and as you're turning there, that psalm we just read was a psalm of King David's. When you think about King David, King David was prophesied over, and he was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. After he's anointed and prophesied over him, he goes on a 12-year detour. And in those 12 years, he's literally running for his life and hiding in caves. That's what he does, year after year after year after year. And so when I read that, I realize King David had a detour. And the detour he was in in his life, God was needing to mold his character within him. Just like each one of us. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the English version, it literally means one and one only. Now, when God says this, if we had time to go back and look at verses 1, 2, and 3, God tells them, you got to fear me, and you got to learn to obey me. Then he tells them right after that, you must teach these things to your children and to your grandchildren. So God's always been generational. And so God's desire right here is he said, you got to teach your families there's only one God. There's not a bunch of gods. There's just one God. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so this is vital that people get this. And the reason I say this is vital, if you want to find your destiny, you got to first find God. Because God is the holder of your destiny. And many times in our life, we wander around for years and years and years because we don't know our God. And without God, my purposes don't, don't add up. We serve an eternal God. And so just as you heard that about King David, now you see this right here. Now, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to know something. 
He is the author of your destiny. He's the author of your destiny. Hebrews 12, way back there in the New Testament. Now, I'm just going to give you a little foundational stuff here to start this week. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are the believers, those are some of you's family members that made it to heaven. And this is what they're doing in heaven. They're cheering you on. They're telling you, run, 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 run. He goes on to say, let us lay aside every weight. Lay aside anything that tries to hinder your progress. Now, there's going to be things that are going to try to, to stump you, to stop you. And then he says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And so when we see the sin that he's talking about, the sin is designed to get us off track. That's exactly what it wants to do. It wants to get you away from fulfilling the destiny that God has for you. He ends in verse 1 and says, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Now, oftentimes, the, the Christian life is likened to a race. And if you notice, he said, run the race with endurance. Endurance doesn't happen overnight. That would be like me sitting on the couch day after day and eating laced potato chips and then saying tomorrow, I'm going to run a marathon. It's not going to happen. And so he says, let us run the race with endurance. And so I, I got to build myself up where I can run to this. And so off of that right there where he says, let us run the race with endurance. Maybe this is a word for some of you right now. You need to get back in the race. It's not too late to get back in the race. And maybe when he says, let us run the race with endurance, is he telling some of us, come on, let's pick up the pace. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let us run with endurance. Why is this all important? Keep reading, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Giving Jesus my undivided attention. Looking to him instead of the distractions. To fix my gaze on him, having eyes for him and only him. So he tells us a nugget here, kind of like we just read in Deuteronomy 6. Hero Israel, the Lord God is, is one God. And now it says, looking unto Jesus. I got to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. Why? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning, he's the end, he's the script writer. So if he's the author and the finisher of my faith, i got to keep looking to him day by day by day. He goes on to say this, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus, he endured this cross, despising the shame. And so what this means here, that Jesus began a race and he finished a race. And it wasn't always easy. On Friday, he was, he's crucified. On Sunday, he rose. I believe what Jesus went through on Friday, he kept his eyes on the prize and said, you know what? I'm going to finish the race. And if you'll notice, it said, he sat down. You don't sit down until the job's finished or you finish the race. And so that's Jesus' desire for us. He's the author and the finisher of, of our faith. He wants us to run the race, but he wants us to finish it and finish it strong. Verse 3, for consider him, the Lord Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Man, you remember the long litany against him. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The Lord doesn't want us to become weary. He doesn't want us to become discouraged. So the author of this, I believe he's telling us, keep looking to Jesus. Just keep looking to Jesus. And when he uses those words weary and discouraged, you know what that tells me? There's going to be things that are going to come after you that are going to try to weary you and discourage you. And when I see those things weary and discouraged, those sometimes can be the detours of our life 
And so in the detours of our life, the Lord is wanting to mold our character. He's wanting to help us. Now, I'm going to show you a great detour of one's life. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37, and, and as you're turning there, living a life of faith, there's going to be these detours. Kind of like the detours on our roads here in Lubbock. Sometimes they're really short, and sometimes they're really long. But we all are going to experience some types of detours. I don't care who you are. Not always bad, okay? These detours aren't bad. Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Just a little biblical history for you. Jacob's father was Isaac. So Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. We know the covenant stories of the Hebrew, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, oftentimes when we study about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have the thought these guys were perfect. Far from perfect. Just like me and you. And the reason I highlight that is no matter how many mistakes you've had, no matter how many flaws, God's not done with you, okay? God doesn't give up on us. Keep reading here. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. Joseph is Jacob's 11th son. He ultimately has 12 sons, but Joseph is the 11th son. And Joseph was 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with some of the sons of Bilia and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, plural. Okay? I'm going to stop there just for a second. Jacob had 12 sons by four different women. Now that's not dysfunction, that's dysfunction multiplied. That's dysfunction on steroids. And so when you study their life, there was some serious, serious complication because they had a lot of baby mama drama is what they had. And if they had a series right now, it wouldn't be staying up with the Kardashians. It'd be staying up with Jacob's family because they put the Kardashians to shame. Now this is how crazy this family was, all right? The bloodline of Jesus goes right through these guys. Then it said, and Joseph bought, bought, brought a bad report of them to his fathers. Now, read this real closely here. Joseph brought a bad report of them, the ten older brothers, to his father. So Joseph is a tattletale. And we go back to the old statement, snitches get stitches. Hmm. Keep reading, verse 4. No, verse 3. Now Israel, which is Jacob, he loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his own age, which literally means he is the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. So the Bible's very clear here. He's, he's Jacob's favorite. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors, a coat of many colors. This coat was, was distinctive. It was a status symbol. It was a royal robe. And this, this, this coat or this tunic, it sent a loud message of legacy, of inheritance, of exalted position and privileged. And, and so this coat right here says, you're better than the rest of them. Verse 4. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. 
Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And what you begin to see here, man, this is a witch's brew right here. This is some crazy stuff going on. So he has this dream, but it could be better stated. The dream had him. Verse 6. So Joseph said to them, he said, Please hear this dream which I've dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf rose also, stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around, and they bowed down to my sheaf. Oh, happy day. And his brother said to him, Shall indeed you reign over us? Or shall indeed you have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, what's interesting here, you begin to see a progression that begins to take place. In verse 4, it says they hated him. In verse 5, it says they hated him even more. And verse 8, it says they hated him even more. The hatred grows so much, and I'm not going to go there today. Eventually, it gets to a place where they said, let's kill him. Let's kill him. That's what hatred does to people. So they hate him. But he's not done. He's not finished. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Now, the Bible will clarify what all that is. Verse 10. So he told it to his father, his mother, His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? So this dream literally was, he tells his entire family, Hey, pops, you and mom are going to bow down to me. And the ten older brothers, they're going to bow down too. Now, I don't know if Joseph had the thought here, Woo, this is a great day. God dreams are good things. Do you realize God still gives people dreams? He still does those things. But every dream that God gives you is not meant for you to share with other people, especially your 10 older brothers. When you read that, you kind of look and think, what kind of stupid were you, Joseph? And so off of this, Joseph didn't have the maturity to keep his mouth shut at 17. And when you read what it talks about, Joseph comes across as extremely, extremely, extremely prideful and arrogant. Proverbs 16, 17 says, pride goes before destruction. And pride is always rooted in insecurity. I, I got to tell you all my accomplishments. I got to tell you everything that's going on. My, because I'm extremely insecure. Proverbs 18, 7 says, a fool's mouth is his destruction. And so the dreams that Joseph had, they were prophetic in nature from God. But Joseph now would experience a multitude of detours in his life. A multitude of them. And so Joseph makes three bad, bad choices before he's 18. The first bad choice was he's a tattletale. He thinks it's his job to tell what everybody else is doing wrong. You know, Dad, I need to point out, the brothers aren't doing really good. The second problem that he has is when he thinks it's his job to share his dreams and again... He he, he brags about his dreams. Both of those first two come from his mouth. So we see immediately this young man, 17, who has these incredible dreams from God. He's got a problem with his tongue. James 1.19 says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. I think Joseph flipped it and he said, I would rather be swift to speak and slow to hear. 
But what you begin to see here, Joseph's problem that came out of his mouth indicated a greater problem. And the greater problem wasn't the things that were coming out of his mouth. The greater problem was something that was in his heart. Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. And so we begin to see here, does Joseph have a problem with something in his heart that manifests out of his mouth? I believe this is what begins to go on here. And so what God's got to begin to do, God takes him on a detour. And the detour is to develop him. And the development him, developing him was for him to reach his destiny. And oftentimes when you get on a detour, things will get worse before they get better. For even me and you. Now I'm going to give you two points real quick here off the word development, okay? The first development, development is often a painful process. And the process is to get you and me to a place where we surrender to God and we learn to obey God quickly and quietly. And so when the detours show up in our life, it's God's way that he, he's going to perform construction on the highway of your soul. He's got some developing to do in your soul. The second area of development is always part of the process of destiny. You're never going to get to, to your destiny without going through some detours. And, and these, these processes here sometimes are like a class. Character 101. Integrity 101. And sometimes when we're in class, we think, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to play a little hooky. I'm going to skip that class because I don't need it. You need it, Okay. You don't want to skip the development classes that God has for us because what will ultimately happen, you'll get a place in your life that you can't handle where you're at because you were never shaped and molded by God. So one of the worst things that can happen to us is we succeed before we're ready. Is that possible? Oh yeah. Don't cut these classes. Allow God begin to move and begin to shape. And like I said, it's not always fun. But God is doing something in us to get us prepared for the destiny. Now, the next few weeks, I'm going to go on through Joseph on what begins to happen to show you he has detour after detour after detour. Let me give you a thought here. He gets this dream at 17. He doesn't walk in the dream until he's 30. Sometimes the detours are long and sometimes they're short. I personally believe this, that throughout your life, you're going to have detours over and over. I don't care how old you get. And remember this, when God is putting you on a detour, there's some things in your life and my life that need to be repaired, that need to be fixed, or they need to be developed. Big dreams require big character. Hmm. Now, I want to walk you through something the rest of the morning here. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Pastor, you've been on detours. I've been on a lot of detours. And sometimes even at my age, God will say, you're not done. I've got to put you back in the oven, pal. We've got to cook on you a little longer. But you know what? Any times I realize that God's put me on a detour, he's got something big that he's preparing me for. So we get to Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul begins to talk in verses 1-2 about the gift of salvation. He talks about how we become righteous because of Jesus. He talks about our grace, the grace of God, which all are incredible. But he shifts gears just a little bit in verse 3. So we pick up in Romans 5 verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Did, did we read that right? Let me read that one more time. That we glory in tribulations. The word tribulations mean pressure, afflictions, hardships, problems, and trials. Do any of those describe any of you right now? You say, that's me to a T. 
I'm going through some pressures. I'm going through some afflictions. But did we read that right? He said, we are to glory in tribulations. Now, that's one of those statements in the Bible that sometimes I look at and I say, I hate that verse. The audacity for for Paul to put that in the Bible, that we are to glory in tribulations. Now, why would he say we are to glory in tribulations? Keep reading. Knowing that tribulations produce or develop perseverance. Endurance. Many translations say patience. So was he telling me and you the only way for us to develop patience is you got to go through some trips? That's exactly what he was saying. Now you don't want to exit. You don't want to skip the tribulation class, okay? Because it's the only way you can get Patience, and and few qualities are necessary as patience. What do I mean by that? James 1, 4 says, let patience have its perfect work. Hebrews 6, 12 says, through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So there's got to be some things going through. And I'm just telling you right now, I don't stand and shout hallelujah when tribulations come to develop patience. It's something the Lord's still working within me. I need patience. But patience is an incredible virtue. One of the reasons I believe that God puts patience in us is to slow us down enough where we begin to not only know God, but we know the voice of God. Be still and know I'm God. For me to be still, you know what that means? I I gotta be patient, I gotta slow down. You know, I have people say at times to me, can you teach me to hear the voice of the Lord? And I said, nope. You gotta learn that on your own. And how do you learn that? Through faith and patience. I learned to get still before God. How many of you have a problem being still? I have a problem if it's still. I mean, I, right now, I'm jumpy as I can be just sitting right here. And if I said, hey, let, let's, let's just be patient. Let's be still. Let's just be quiet for 30 seconds. It would get weird in about five seconds. Because we are so used to these things that try to cling to us that we got to be busy, busy, busy. We've got to always be entertained. we got to be watching. we got to do, 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 do. But this is one of the significance of patience that I believe this is what God was trying to do even with Joseph. You're going to have to be patient. Now, I wish I could tell you I got this mastered. You know, if I was truthful with you guys in the area of patience, I don't know that I'm in elementary school. I still may be in preschool because I can become so stinking impatient. (laughs) On delay, God. I'm used to having my coffee heated in the microwave in 22 seconds. I'm used to going to the ATM and pressing a button and getting money instantly. I'm used to pulling up at the drive-up window of the fast food restaurant where it's... I'm used to going to a traffic light, and this is a tough one on me. Oh, my gosh, I lose my salvation over red lights, I'm telling you. My wife will tell you, he grows horns when he drives. I I still have to watch this. This this is the truth. I will sit at a traffic light and I'll watch the other one. I get to a four-way stop and my motto is, you delay, you're last. I go. Even if it's not my turn, you're too late. I look at him like, sorry, Charlie. You guys, I'm serious. And so the Lord's always working with patience, 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 patience. Tribulation produces patience. Tribulation produces endurance. Now remember what he said in in Hebrews 12. He said, run the race with endurance. Patient. Now it doesn't stop there. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance 
and perseverance produces or develops character. Now, the word character is an interesting word. It has the meaning of proven maturity. The word character means tried integrity. Well, I want to be the president of the company, but you lie. I, I want to be the, the, the CEO of this, but you steal. You're a time thief. And so we want all these blessings, and character is a big deal to God. You know what character is? Doing what's right when the only one that's watching is God. And it's interesting, he says, tribulation produces patience, and patience produces character. See, character is a big thing in our society right now. If you're a business owner or you manage somewhere, you would die for character with your employees. That you don't have to be a micromanager. I mean, we're always looking. That's why, that's why Daniel in Daniel 6 was so incredible. He had a spirit of excellence upon him. He had character that was molded and shaped in him. I, I want to be in the position that Daniel was. I want, him to, I want to be the leader like Daniel was. I just don't want to do what he did to get there. Don't skip character 101, okay? Learn to become a man or woman of integrity, tried integrity. And he doesn't stop and he says, and character produces this thing called hope. Character produces hope. A, a true hope, a, a real hope. A hope that stays steady. Even in the storm, a hope that stays, uh, stays positive, even in the, the chaos of life. Hope. Why is hope such a big deal? Keep reading. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given it to us. And so he's talking about a kingdom hope. And you know what I believe the hope is? That God's going to get you and me to our destiny and you hang on to it. You hang on to that, that, that prophetic dream. You hang on to, he put hope within me. And that hope is marked by the love of God. And when you see the word love right there, it's the gopi, the God kind of love that's unconditional. And then you know what he said? And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby. And you think of everything that took place. Tribs produce patience, patience, character, character, hope. And then he said, now here's what your hope is based on. The love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what I see in that last verse? The love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. They're going to cause the things in your life to come to fruition. But I, I can't get away from the process. These, these detours of life will happen. And I'm just telling you, sometimes you might as well walk around with a sign on that says, I'm under construction. I'm being remodeled. And when you think about construction and remodel, it usually takes longer than you think. Now I want you to stand up here with me. See, if you think about this, God's got you under construction. God's remodeling you. God wants to upgrade us. He wants to upgrade us. And so we got to be fixed. We got to be repaired. We got to be developed. And so we, we, we got to go back to some things. Let me ask, ask you some questions. Do you know the Lord Jesus? Do you know Father God? See, without Father God and the Lord Jesus, you, you, you never reach your destiny. You'll never make it. The second area is, do I look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith? H have you gotten out of the race? Do you, you need to get back in the race. Do you know I, I need to pick up the pace? But then a couple things off of, of Joseph. 
You have a, you have a tongue problem? I think the tongue problem will probably impact every one of us in life. That we'll have to go to not breaking the 11th commandment. Some of you didn't know there were 11 commandments in the Bible. The 11th commandment says, thou shalt not be hung by thy tongue. That's really not in the Bible, okay? <laughs> but every one of us have to get to a place where we say, Lord, grace me to be swift to hear and slow to speak. And every one of us deal with this area called pride because we have these insecurities. The only thing that brings me true security is Jesus. He secures me. And so maybe some of these, maybe they describe you right now. Maybe you're on a detour of life. And then we get over to what we just talked about. Man, how many of you need patience? How many of us need character just to keep molding and shaping my character? How many of us need fresh hope today? He gives hope to the hopeless. And so I just want you to bow your head right there where you're at right now. And we go back to the first passage there in Psalm 31. Lord, my times are in your hand. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe your times are in the Lord's hand? Now, if you do, I'm just going to ask you, if you feel comfortable to do this, raise your hands to heaven with your palms pointed up. And with my palms pointed up, I say, Father God, I'm ready to receive. I'm ready to receive your patience. Mold my character, Lord. Stir back hope within me. Lord, work within my tongue. Work within my heart. Grace me, Father God, in this time of the detour. And Lord, the things in my life that need to be fixed, fix them. The things in my life that need to be repaired, repair them. And the things in my life that need to be developed, go ahead and develop them within me today, Father God. Now our team's gonna begin to, to, to lead us in songs right here. And just maybe you wanna come down to the altar and say, Lord, I'm open my heart right now to you. I, I, I welcome your construction and I welcome your remodeling. Upgrade me today, Father God. Go ahead and sing, guys.
Come on, let's raise our hands here to heaven. Father God, we thank you today that our times are in your hands. Again, Father God, we know you're never late, you're never early, it's right on time. So Lord, we ask you to do a work within each one of us. Fill us fresh and new today, Lord. But move within us, birth the things within us that need to be birthed. And I, I went to Bible school when I was 22 and I had some encounters with God where just that, that desire to, to be in the ministry and the pastor. And so I come out of Bible school and I have the thought, I'm, I'm the man with the power for the hour. I got this, God. And God put me on a 13-year detour. 13 years. It didn't mean I didn't do anything. God was working and developing. And there were days I'd stop my foot and I'd say, God, I'm not getting any younger. And as I look back at it, the rear view mirror of life, God was so good to me. Because if I would have got in, if I would have got in the ministry at a younger age, I'd have caused a lot of damage because I didn't have the character. I didn't have the pillar of character to uphold what he was wanting to do. And the other thing is, I, I couldn't stand to be in front of people. I, I couldn't be in front of people. I couldn't pray in front of people, but yet I thought I was going to be a pastor. And so God began to work and me mold me, and I, I, I began to speak to little bitty guys, fifth and sixth graders. They even laughed at my jokes. I was so happy. And then God promoted me. I kept going up. I kept going up. And, and there, there were days when I would be in the pulpit. Man, my, my, my knees would be cracking. I'd be shaking on the inside. I mean, I was like, oh, God, you got to help me. You gotta. And God was like, I got to keep developing. You got to keep developing. And when I'd first begin to preach, I would never look at people in the eyes. I'd look right over their eyes. I'd look at the exit sign back there. But God just begins to shape you. And the reason I tell you, God is shaping some of you right now. God is molding you. God is, God is birthing some things. He's establishing things. So, Father God, our prayer is right now, if you're here on live stream, this is for you too. My time, Lord, is in your hands. I welcome you, Father God. I welcome you to do what you need to do in Jesus' name. Come on, let's clap to the Lord. Well, you can go back to your seat. It's a good morning. This is one that we'll hit each week for a little bit. and Just watch how, how God will begin to move. And each week you'll see some things. Okay. Uh, remember the groups to tonight at 5. Be sure and check online for those. We pray Tuesday night and then get here on Wednesday. Men, you got to get registered for the men of iron. It's, it's moving quickly. That'll start a week from Thursday. All right, bless you. Have a good week. Amen. We're going to carry that into our lives this week, right? Through the detours that God has us on and grow through them. Amen. We're so glad all of you came out today. I'm going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Proverbs 31 verse 8 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. You may say, well, how can I do that? I'm just little old me and I work my little job and have my little family and how can I make a difference in the world? How can I be speaking up for people that are oppressed? Well, 
One way is you can give your tithes and offerings. And when you do that, we join everybody's money together. And this church gets to spend, gets to send over 10% of everything that comes in. We get to send it out to ministries that are helping in countries that have oppressed people. We get to send it out to ministries here locally that are helping poor people and homeless people and oppressed people in our state and in our nation. And when we all join together, it makes a big difference, right? We all can be a part of being biblical and helping other people. So I encourage you, give because you will be making a difference. Let me say a blessing over you. Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone that gives, Lord, the tithers, Lord, those that give offerings. Father, I pray that you would just give us eyes to see beyond ourselves, God, that we would do things, Father, for your kingdom, and you would take our gifts, God, and make a major impact, Father, in people's lives and their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of announcements remind you, ladies, Friday night is our cherished night. We're going to feed you dinner, okay? But we need to know you're coming so we know how much food to order. So if you have not signed up on that little purple slip, there's a QR code right out here at the computer. You can sign up as well. Men, you can sign up for Men of Iron there. Remember our groups tonight. We'd love to see you for that. And hey... If you have a baby, we're going to have baby dedications. You need to sign up. The last thing is when you walk out the door back there, you're going to see we have set up something for Proposition A in our community. We have a sign out here. We need you to stand up for righteousness. There is a national group and a group from Austin that's trying to bring this into the city of Lubbock that you can possess a large amount of marijuana, even though it's illegal from the state of Texas to purchase it. But we've got to stand up. We do not want this for our children and they don't vote, adults do. They already have a lot of signatures of people for it because they think it's going to help our police department, it's not. We must stand up as the church, right? And stand up for righteousness and vote against this. So pick up a yard sign out here. Pick up some of these. If you own a business, grab some to set out at your business. We love